All right, guys, welcome back to the podcast. Today, we have a guest with us, Mr. Jamie Wright. Jamie, what is the crack with you? Not too much, Dean. Needing some caffeine, but we're making it through. How are you? We're good. We're good. Um, I have already reached my caffeine limit for the day, but uh, just having some tea here. But uh, so we got we got Jamie on um, to talk about a few different things. But before we jump into the actual topics, do you want to give yourself a bit of an introduction, a bit of an elevator pitch, Jamie? Sure. Um, well, my name is Jamie Wright. Um, I own and run Balance. We're a team of nutritionists and dietitians based up in Belfast. Um, well, I'm based up in Belfast, but the other two coaches are actually based over in England. And we help people predominantly with feeding, binge eating, uh, sports nutrition, and long-term weight management. Um, and we've been running now for six years. So it's me, L, and Lisa. And uh, yeah, unlike most of the industry, we're all qualified. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's a good start. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of me in a nutshell, more or less. I'm not going to say anything too incriminating. Uh, I'll just leave it at the professional speed to start off. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, uh, <coughs> we'll, we'll lead you down that path later on, you know. It's, uh... Yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so the topic of today, we're going to go over, because as you said, one of your specialities is uh, helping people with binge eating. And I think that is a good topic to go down um, because obviously that's your expertise. Um, But yeah, I suppose like just jumping straight in, when you're dealing with somebody that, um, that's struggling with binge eating, what... What, what are some of the first places that you would start with them if, if a client came to you and they were struggling with binge eating? Obviously, it'd be your screening process, et cetera. But yep. what are some of the first things that, that you typically do with a client that is struggling with this? It sounds a bit strange, but the first thing that we try to do before anything is actually to kind of curate an environment where they feel secure and comfortable to actually talk about these things. Because we it's not just women that we work with. And I know women would be a bit hesitant to work with with a man because I think the majority of men who they might have had experiences with can be quite blunt with these things because they don't really understand them in all that depth and that's quite normal because as men we're not really sort of culturally brought into emotional discussions and, and for the better part binge eating is I would say in virtually most cases uh, an emotionally driven coping skill so it, it can be quite a difficult thing for a woman uh, and especially for a man because I think you used to know probably more than most how difficult it is to get other men to actually speak about something more than just football or sort of what's happened at the weekend um, so getting them to like open up is, is very difficult and so my first port of call is to actually create a space um, our coaches' first protocol is to create a space where they feel like that's that's available to them, and they're not going to be made to feel like they lack in willpower or determination to achieve a goal, or they're weak, or or whatever else it could be, whatever other sort of generic space has been kind of thrown at them in the past. Um, but it's 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 sort of opening up in confidence and and sort of not feeling that same level of guilt or judgment that they may feel elsewhere. So that would kind of be our first thing that I would focus on. I think that is the most difficult hurdle for most people is to actually just start the conversation, really, because it's quite a, it's still quite a taboo thing, really, isn't it? You know, to have, uh, you know, because most people will do it in private. Uh, you know, it's, I know there's obviously like this, I think YouTube's kind of uh, taken it down a more sensationalized route with this like mukbang thing. I don't know if you guys have seen that. Yeah, it's like the people who who literally, it's 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 like binging on camera essentially. You know, while mm-hmm. overeating, but it, it essentially replicates like binge eating behavior on camera. It's are but like, um, you know, in, in sort of like the day to day life, it's 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 a shameful thing. 
still it's a shameful thing to be to be weak or it's thought of as that so most people will do it behind closed doors and so just to give them that space is, is kind of our first first focus and then after that you know uh, kind of like being had said you know you kind of have your your formal process um i suppose with the screenings and, and whatnot and um, for us it's like really trying to get to the root cause you know and for some people that may be their present and and for a lot of people that could be their past so some people we're not just working you know helping them manage the day-to-day -day. for some people you have to actually work retroactively to start moving forward in the present which can be quite complex especially if some people deal with certain traumas you know and 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 if you look at a lot of the literature and, and, and studies on disordered eating, eating disorders, um, the cases that, that kind of present um, in terms of, of ones which do have some kind of trauma linked to them. Um, you know, it's a very high percentile of those are sexual trauma. And then you start to look into the themes of control, loss of control, looking to gain that back, escapism, all these sort of things. So it's quite, it's quite complex and we obviously go into a lot more depth than, than say like how most people wouldn't would sort of see these things because most people kind of see it as a willpower issue like why can't they just stop eating you know and that's kind of the sentiment that's shared by the people around them and even the people they confide in because they might not understand it as well so uh i wish i had an easy answer for you is the <laughs> is the honest truth, but um, I think you know our you know to answer your question and, and to stop waffling, which I'll be bad at because Brian knows that I just talk nonsense twenty four seven. <laughs> like this is me being like half professional at the moment, so we just give it like half an hour just to go <laughs> down to the tank way. Um, you know our first our first thing that we focus on is that that environment where we encourage open dialogue and in a guilt free, judgment free place. So. Hope that answers your question. Ten minutes yeah. later. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very good. Um, something that occurred to me here that you might uh, talk to us a little bit about, but I think I think often people feel like, as you said, they're they're going out of control and they don't really get why they're doing this stuff. And obviously, open up this dialogue can probably help to shed some light on it, but. For people who are going to be listening to this like the binge eating serves some sort of purpose for them right and i do think it's usually helpful to, to frame it like that you know in terms of it's not like you're not working against yourself necessarily you're you have this kind of maladaptive strategy to help you out in this situation so like what what do you think that the, the purpose is that it serves for a lot of these people who are struggling with this you know, why is it there as a behavior? Very simply, like uh, every single coping skill that we have is simply a means in which we can manage difficult situations, difficult emotions that we can't fully deal with sort of without that skill, you know, and, and binging is one uh, sort of iteration of that, but you've got everything from binging to alcoholism drug taking you know some people self-harm you know these are all technically coping skills at the end of the day um, they kind of range on levels of severity of course but i think for each individual it's you know it's unique what it means to them so that's what binge eating is and in, in sort of a nutshell it's a way of coping with with difficult emotion difficult challenge or, or trying to make sense of the world when it gets a bit too chaotic for your ability to deal with it yeah which is why then you know when some people say you know if i could just get this food thing sorted out i'll be fine where mm -hmm. in reality it's the the food is part of the solution in this kind of convoluted way rather than actually being the problem and you actually flip that sentence around it makes more sense for them i'll be fine and the food thing will get sorted rather than I'll sort the food thing and then I'll be fine. You know, yeah. horse yeah. before the cart sort of thing. Yeah. And that the, the, eat, the binge eating is just a manifestation of, of some difficulty. And yeah, I think a lot of it is, is down to what helping people 
see that and become more aware of that um because as we're kind of saying here they're often not that aware sometimes they are uh sometimes they come in with that level of self-awareness maybe if they've had help with it in the past or something but Mm -hmm. um often they're they're kind of in the dark as to why they're acting that way and i think you know helping people see the role it actually serves for them and then you can go and obviously try and do something about it so with that in mind you know so the binge eating is a coping mechanism to deal with emotional difficulty essentially so do you try and help people use other strategies in that context um or what kind of way do you look at it to essentially reduce the binge eating uh, when when that's how it's arising it kind of depends on the person you know because if we're dealing you know because for some people they may not realize something like significant trauma in an early life has actually affected their day-to-day and then it kind of just makes sense to them in that moment and then at that stage you're kind of thinking you know should I consider triaging this person out to another service which may be more beneficial because that's what we've done in the past you know I've worked with people and I'm like you know it's it's brilliant that we found this causal factor but it's not in my wheelhouse to deal with you know I'm not here to help someone process you know being a victim of sexual trauma at a young age that's not my job like I'm, I'm the food guy <laughs> you know yeah. at the end of the day so it kind of depends on the person like we have a range of tools that will help people with and and uh, I'm very fortunate that the the coaches on the team you know have a, a range of further qualifications in, in sort of mental health skills and, and sort of working with people in that capacity so even with the more severe cases you know I sort of know my own limitations so I'll you know very happily put them in front of Lisa or L who are better served to work with them than I am um so it really just depends you know but again it's I think that the thing that I try to help people focus on the most is to not view the binge for what it is like don't focus on the outcome focus on the process you know try and figure out why I did what I did in this moment because if you can start to sort of piece it together and figure out you know okay well I did this, which led to that, which ultimately resulted in this, you know, it's a lot easier than just saying, well, I'm a terrible person because that happened, you know, and then you get caught in that cycle where it's, you know, it it sort of predicts itself in the future. You know, whenever you start to get into that cycle of, of, of negative self-talk, which then spirals in severity itself, then you start to find that people get into binge eating cycles where it's like, I guilt myself into restriction but then the restriction leads to the binging, you know, or, or if it's not restriction, it's rigidity. And if it's not rigidity, it's a combination of restriction and rigidity. So yeah, again, didn't answer your question. That was, <laughs> <laughs> it was just a big waffly space. <laughs> right. That was perfect. That was perfect. Like I get to the end uh, of a rant and I'm just like, nah, I didn't answer that at all. Did I? <laughs> that's what podcasts are for we're not doing like a two minute uh bbc 24 or uh 20 bbc news 24 clip or anything like that we have plenty of time so no sound bites here there's no sound bites here just rambles rambles of a madman yeah yeah so yeah i suppose it's finding the meaning behind it Mm -hmm. and getting to the bottom of it rather than sort of allowing in, in a lot of cases, clients would end up just ruminating. And as you say, this sort of negative feedback, I'm a, I'm a shit person. Look what I've done. How am I ever going to get out of this? It's sort of like breaking that cycle. Definitely, You get is. lost in the event that's happened, you know? Yeah. And it's very easy to do it, especially because most, most people who you're dealing with uh, eating disorder, disordered eating, you know, I think over 90% of people who deal with these also deal with a, a mental health condition. So just, it's just that easy to fall into that loop of just feeling like you're a total piece of crap all the time because of this one instance, which then follows into the next, into the next, into the next, and that gets progressively worse, you know? And uh, for us, like the hardest 
the hardest the hardest thing is that initial start because it's trying to get people to buy into this this way of thinking which is more process driven not so much results driven you know it's not that you did or didn't binge it's what you learned from it which is more important you know so but it's very difficult to get people to buy into that because it's almost like a new perspective on the world as a whole you know for in a kind of a sick sort of way they're a lot more secure with binging because when it becomes habitual there's a certain sense of familiarity with it you know and, and that's sort of what they need is in a, in a weird way and they find it through binging is is familiarity and, and security now obviously the, the sort of the way that they're going about it is is detrimental to them but that's sort of the misconstrued way that they've got it you know and, and what you're trying to do is support them to buy into this less secure less familiar way of living way of life you know way of perceiving things which ultimately moves them away from binge eating which they know is unhealthy for them but it's the only way they have of managing life when it gets shit you know so you kind of have to help them see why they do what they do and then also help them manage it as well you know and that can be quite difficult for someone who does suffer with a mental health condition as well because speaking from experience boys get sad too you know i lived with i lived with binge eating myself personally i had it for 10 plus years easy um and everything in between like tried it all boys i was i was like your uh, poster girl for you know sad sad blonde white girl except for i was ugly irish boy <laughs> ugly ginger irish boy <laughs> uh, uh like i i i binge eating uh bulimia feel bulimia you know because have you ever tried to make yourself sick quite hard i'm not talking after a night i've been i'm talking like you know just mm. you know during the day is uh, something to do mm. um anorexia and, and then living with kind of like anxiety depression for uh, probably a longer time than that so uh, it's it's a lot easier said than done so i kind of uh, i suppose some of the clients that i work with kind of find a bit of comfort in that that they see someone that they can that they know sort of relates to what they're going through in a way um, not that i'm saying not that i'm advising that like i'm not a method nutritionist by any means like i'm not going to mm. I'm going to recommend everyone, you know, dips into 10 years of depression for their crack just to make mm. themselves better at what they do. Um, but certainly I feel like I, I kind of use that now to help me with what I do instead of letting it sort of like be all that time wasted because you don't get it back. So, mm. Um, mm. yeah. Forgot what your original question was, Dean. <laughs> Forgot what it was myself now, uh, but sure. <laughs> There's pl- plenty of things we touched on there anyway, but... Uh... Should have had, ca- should have had a coffee. Should have <laughs> had a coffee. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think what you're saying there about your own experiences with it, um, and obviously you were saying earlier about how it's difficult to get lads to talk about this stuff because it's like, you know, it's not a very lad thing to talk about your yeah. feelings or your emotions, right? You know? Yeah. So if if a, if a guy comes to you and they there's obviously they've they've come to you and they know right I obviously need help with this but they're struggling to sort of get to that place where they can open up a little bit more and get working on the things that they need to work on to overcome these issues. What's kind of like even you know you can talk about your own experience in terms of what you had to do to over to overcome that barrier or with clients that that you've seen yeah i wish i had a good answer for that but it's it's tough because every single guy is different you know socioeconomic background factors into it an awful lot um you know and, and, and i suppose that's kind of one of the reasons why i actually really like you guys and sort of what you do you know it's a collection of men who are quite progressive 
I think in that sort of domain. I don't know if that's the right word. I'm trying to mm. think about it. Um, but you know, sort of hi Cody. I heard him yelling. <laughs> um, that's the owner. <laughs> <laughs> that's Dean never going down to court anyway. Uh, <laughs> like uh, just knowing Brian and, and sort of you know talking to him actually in real life, which is uncommon these days um and and sort of having a good chat to him and, and like I, I don't know you as well Dean but I'm assuming you're kind of in the same boat or else um you probably wouldn't be a part of triage and 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 just kind of I know Gary more recently opened up about his sort of story with with his sort of mental health and I thought that was really really a great thing for him to do because you kind of see him and, and sort of you would see Brian and yourself and you kind of see, you know, three guys that have got their life together, you know, self-employed, their own men, da 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 But you don't always see sort of what's going on behind that as well. And I feel like we're still, I know there's, there's more of a movement for men to talk more openly at the moment, but I feel like it's not being led by men a lot of the time. And that it's nothing against the women doing that. You know, in fact, I applaud them, you know, and thank you very much for doing it. But I feel like it has to be a, we need more examples of it to make it more acceptable, I think, in this day and age. And that's, that's honestly, I, I've, you know, I've worked with everyone, policemen, firefighters, boxers, you know, rugby players, you know, any sort of physical job, any sort of physical sport, you know, these sort of, uh, if you want to call them like macho, uh, I, I don't know if these sort of like macho personas. And you actually give them the space to open up and, and talk about these things. And, you know, it's the first time in their life that they, they've been given the opportunity to do it. And there's so much that they have to say, but they've just never been able to say it. And I think that's a shame. I think it's a real shame. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the, discourse around and a lot of the services around and a lot of the materials around eating disorders and disordered eating are tailored more towards women and certainly have more of a feminine feel to them um, than than a more neutral sort of you know what I'm saying you used to have probably seen it you know if it's it's mm-hmm. and I just I I, I, I don't know how to break that, you know, because I feel like it's, there's a, there's a, a wave of, of, of support in terms of women embracing that and opening up and seeking out the support, but there's not the same for men. I feel like for men, that's because we are, you know, I would say from an evolutionary standpoint, we are, we are on islands a lot of the time, you know, we're built for competition with each other. We're not built to be collective. And, and support each other in groups, you know, whereas women, I think, are, are the opposite from that, really. And I think you see that, you know, particularly on social media, you know, so I wish I had a good answer for it, especially for Ireland, but I think Ireland's probably still a few decades away from, you know, letting the guy open up and tell people he's not feeling that great and someone not turn around, you know, and just be like, ah, oh, you're grand. Or rock your bollocks. You're talking shit. You know what I mean? So, hey, we've got the highest rate of suicide among any of the home nations. So, something needs to be done. So, it does. Mm. I want to use tell a joke because I feel like I really brought down the tone. <laughs> <laughs> a very depressing to go on. So, we're only 20 minutes in. <laughs> Brian, tell a joke. Get Fiona D on again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i could i could get cody over here to uh you know to brighten up the room a little bit but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Look, look man the message is still important you know um maybe that's maybe maybe that's the problem jamie you're just trying to throw in jokes instead of having this conversation because isn't that just a guy thing to do i mean i have been called the ryan reynolds of nutrition now, i thought that was because of how i look and your but it might it might be my persona, you know, which is borderline unbearable. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
no, but it, it is a, it is obviously a massive issue. And then when you actually look at uh, eating disorders, you know, in, in the context of binge eating, which we're talking about, the, it's pretty much 50-50, right? In terms of men and women who yep. suffer from eating disorders. Uh, or sorry, who suffer from binge eating as an eating disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, I know the the others are a bit skewed and, you know, potentially that's a data collection issue, maybe, but um, at least for the data we have on binge eating, yeah, it's it's pretty much 50-50. And you know, like, you, like we've, you've been talking about, it's like giving people that space to open up, you know, men and women, but as you said, men have a harder time with it generally. Uh, yeah. But I've definitely worked with women who who've had a hard time opening up oh, about things. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And yeah, it's it can be it can be hard to to get them talking about it, which it was unfortunate because it's very difficult to actually make any change if they're not going to be able to communicate with you or they're not willing to communicate. And obviously, some of that falls back onto us as coaches and in, uh, in terms of cultivating that space, as you spoke about in the beginning. Um, but even still, uh, I think some, some guys will have difficulty with it, which is, it's just tough because as a coach sitting on the other side of that, um, you can see that they need to start talking about this stuff a little bit more and let down the walls a little bit to actually get where they want to be. And they, they just really struggle to do it. Um, so I know it's definitely a frustration of mine when it feels like you can't get through, um, it's the worst feeling in the world when you know someone really needs the support, but they don't trust the support that they're yeah. going to receive, probably because of past experiences as well, you know, which is just. Yeah. And there, and there can be a lot to unpack, as you were saying, like, you know, sometimes it's, it's a referral out that they really need, but there's the stigma associated with that potentially. So they don't want to do that. Like they're very happy to say, yeah, I have a nutrition coach versus i go see a therapist you know once a week or whatever it may be yeah. um which is tough then because then you know for us as coaches it's going to put us in a difficult situation where this person is willing to work with you to some extent and you don't want to just turf them out yes you can see very, you can see oftentimes quite clearly that it's not your health that they need necessarily mm-hmm. and that you should you know they should be referred out but you also don't want to say, okay, I think you should be referred out. And then they stop working with you and then they don't seek that help anyway. Cause then where are they at? Um, so yeah, it, it can be tricky. Um, and like, I'm sure it's happened to you a lot where, where, where essentially that's happened. Someone signed up for nutrition coaching cause they're like, yeah, yeah I just need to get the food sorted. Um, and it's obviously not the issue, but there's way less, stigma around hiring a nutritionist versus going to see a counselor or a therapist but what kind of flags do you see for for people when they probably need the next step up in terms of like you know working with a mental health professional solely or at least in conjunction with what you're doing because i think the, i think it work, works very well in tandem quite often but we shouldn't necessarily be the only ones that they're trying to get help from yeah uh... I think it's, um, you know, it's something I kind of struggle with. I mean, there's obviously like sort of, I don't want to say like telltale, um, but sort of flags is probably an easier way to describe it, actually. You know, sort of red flags that stand out for me would be on the lines of that sort of sexual trauma. Um, You know, and it's it's not just necessarily triaging someone out to like a counseling service, but it's also like maybe would they, would they, maybe uh, find more value in a one-to-one, you know, in person, as opposed to remote, you know, because remote's great because you can do it with anyone all over the world, you know, and I I sort of love doing it remotely, but um, I'm not sort of naive to the fact that some people would prefer to have a space, an actual physical space they can go to to talk to someone, you know? So I think there's there's definitely cases where we've had to to look at that as well. I think there's been instances where certainly we've we've seen clients come through the doors with 
more mental health issues than food issues. You know, it's almost like food is, is the ultimate outcome, but, you know, they're in the midst of severe depression, you know, and, and you can kind of, how you kind of measure that is difficult in a way, but I think you, you kind of inherently know as a coach, you know, food is not the problem here. You know, and it's, I think you have to be very honest with that because I know the temptation would be to try and fix them, you know, because that's what we want to do. Like the nutrition coaches, we want to help fix their nutrition. But if it's not nutrition that needs fixed, then I think you need to be disciplined with your own scope of practice at that stage, which, you know, a younger me wouldn't have been. But nowadays I would be a lot more uh, stringent. I think with the people that we take on and and uh, over lockdown, you know, there was the cases that were kind of coming to us were getting more severe uh, in a way. And I just felt like we couldn't take most of them on. And it kind of broke my heart in a way because you're speaking to these people over the phone who are like in tears. Yeah. And you're like, we just, we wouldn't be right. Do you know what I mean? Like, like it's, the first, my first thought is always do no harm. Mm. And you're just, you're working with these people or you're talking to these people, sorry. And, um, you know, these people who are desperate, like honestly desperate, you know, because the waiting lists at the moment for, for getting these services are through the roof, you yeah. know, good luck getting, good luck getting any sort of help in six months sort of thing at the moment. And, uh, you know, I was just saying, something like, yeah, it just wouldn't be right for you. You know, it just, it wouldn't, like, I know you're kind of at the end of your tether, but this is not, it just, it wouldn't help. It wouldn't be helpful. So I don't really have like a, a clear and honest, a clear and, well, well, I have an honest answer that I don't really know, but I don't really have a clear answer as to where that cutoff point is. I felt, I feel like, like I said, a younger me wouldn't really have been able to distinguish that. Whereas when you've worked with so many people at this stage, you know, and I'm quite, I'm quite sort of um, proud to say that we've worked with like hundreds of people in this capacity now at this stage. So when you've worked with that many people, you do sort of get more of a, a better understanding of the landscape, I think, and, and kind of see where your scope is limited and where a remote service is not right. Um, and then at that stage, it's like, okay, well, now I have to be disciplined and have those difficult conversations with them to tell them. Um, but I don't think there's like a, there's not a barometer I can say to a coach to go look at and be like, here, this is how depressed this person has to be before you have to tell them, go chat to someone else. Um, I think you just, you kind of have to be honest with it, you know? And like I said, you know, the people dealing with like severe trauma, I think is, is quite a common one. At least for us, anyway, I don't know what it's like for anyone else, but I feel like if someone's coming to you with that, then the first thing you should do is maybe talk to them about maybe seeking out counselor or therapist, not just not just to work with them in isolation, you know, but to maybe work alongside them. And there's a lot of great charities out at the moment who offer those kind of services. Um, and it's not just the NHS that you kind of have at your disposal anymore. So, or I don't, I don't know what you guys have down south a bit. <laughs> Naive to that. Um, obviously, like up north and in the UK and, and whatever, we have the NHS and their mental health services that are kind of like stretched thin beyond belief. Um, but there's tons of charities up here, especially up north, um, that are offering sort of counselling service for a more affordable rate with people who are actually pretty good at what they do as well. So. Um, but yeah, I'm not too sure if down south has like the equivalent. Uh, I'm not too sure. Mm. Like, like, what would you guys like refer out to the, to to that, or sort of what would be your sort of? Typically, the 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 HSE would probably be. Um, it's not as strong as the NHS, um, and typically the waiting list is way longer than it should be, um, especially for mental health services and stuff like that. So yeah, it's. It's probably it's it's in a similar position basically. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's, there's just a there's just there's just not enough resources there for it, and it's really unfortunate because you're dealing with as you said earlier, 
you're, you're on one end of the spectrum, you're dealing with people that can't slash won't tackle these issues, you know, if they're a male, as an example. And then maybe finally you get somebody to a place where it's like, I'm ready to talk about this. And then it's like, oh, sorry, we don't have any services for you. You're going to have to wait six months to a year. It's like, what's going to happen to that person in, in, in that time frame? Like, you know, so it's, it's a big problem. Um, and then I, 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 it's, I it's, as a lot of things we're talking about, it's, it's out of my wheelhouse in terms of understanding the, the complexity of it often and solutions to it. But um, I think the pandemic has definitely made it worse as well. As you said, like there's just, 100%. you know, it's, it's, it's um, like I, I would count myself lucky in a sense, because obviously the, um, the pandemic has been difficult for everybody. Um, and there's been times over the last 18 months where I'm just, where I have been like, fuck this. Like I've just been annoyed, I've been irritated, but you know, there are other individuals where this has been just a living nightmare for them um, and they can't get help with it. Um, and it's, it's really sad to see, you know? Yeah. But I think like a lot of people before the pandemic, at least as it relates to these issues, we're kind of walking around with like a loaded gun. Um, and the pandemic was kind of the thing that pulled the trigger on it for a lot of them. You know, when you don't have what is essentially a, a constant distraction in terms of like a work routine all the time, which you can turn your brain off to for, you know, eight, 10 hours a day, you're almost in autopilot mode your whole life. And then the, the, the first few weeks when you're kind of face to face with your own reality, you're like, oh shit. You know, and I think... That's what you've kind of seen. And with each lockdown that's come into, come into place, those numbers have just shoot, skyrocketed. So, um, yeah. Well, thanks for asking me a simple question, Brian. Um... <laughs> I, did not, I did not bring you on here to, to ask you simple questions, Jamie, unfortunately. Uh, apparently, apparently. Simple questions be wasted on you. So, um <laughs> You know, you have a lot of uh, valuable things to say. So we'll get to the this or that later. That'll be simple. Thank God. That'll round, Thank that'll God. round it off in simple fashion. But um, yeah, I know like generally when I'm referring to people referring out, uh, it usually has to be done privately. Like, because as you said, the the wait times are, are too long. Like it's, mm -hmm. me it's, it's mental. Excuse the poor <laughs> phrasing, but like. I liked it. Very it's, funny. <laughs> that's a, I, I thought of one actually while you were speaking there about the remote coaching and you'd probably deem it to be fantastic wouldn't you um i'm just gonna go actually <laughs> <laughs> uh, the context there being jamie has a lot of clients in finland i believe his first clients were in finland somehow Finish. yeah hey i'm big in finland what can i say <laughs> we're yeah. kind of a big deal i don't know if you've heard about me in finland <laughs> I have to go to Finland and then see what they what it is they say about you. Right. So maybe it's when like, I finish, I'll uh, I'll look you up. I think uh, oh God. I think I'm actually the minister for health, which I didn't realize over in Finland. So <laughs> I probably should go over there and you know discuss some policies, make yeah. it warmer for one. Mm -hmm. um, you know everyone else is getting this global warming. Let's get some. Come on, lads, stop messing around. <laughs> Yeah, you could probably yeah. do something about the, the sunlight as well, like sunlight exposure yeah. throughout the year. You could just uh, solve some of that. Um, like, I would like to go to Finland to see the northern lights, so if you could make that more, like, guaranteed and rather, like, yeah, yeah. Like having to hedge your bets. Um, I know that's kind of out of your wheelhouse as the Minister for Health, but uh, you'll know people, you know. Of course. Chances I'm, deep, are. I'm deep in the Finnish government. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anyone. So what I was saying was that it is a, it is, it is literally mental that people have to wait so long to access some of these services. When if you have somebody who's, you know, deep, deep in a depression and suicidal and it's like, okay, we'll have a chat to you about that in about a month's time. So hang in there. Um, Try not to get any more sad until then. Yeah. Like it's just, it makes no sense um I, it's just it's it's depressing in itself that 
people will have to be have to hang on for another month another two months if you know if they need to see a psychiatrist or something which is is extremely hard even even if you're doing it privately it's hard to get a psychiatrist um so never mind publicly and and look like the generally the people who are working with us you know probably be able to afford to go and, and see someone privately um but obviously that's not always the case so i guess we have a bit of an easier time making those referrals because we can be pretty confident that you know they can ring up a counselor or a therapist uh, today and they'll probably see them next week or in the next two weeks right so we're fortunate in that sense but um yeah i mean it, it's you know your heart goes out to the people who aren't in that position and still need the same help if not more so because as you said the socioeconomic factors play into this massively as well mm -hmm. yeah and that's why i think like it's it's you know if you can find charities to refer out to like i'm very fortunate that i've i was speaking to a lady from a charity called links counseling who are based all over northern ireland and they offer free services for people who are the most socially deprived you know if you can't afford it they'll not charge you and not everyone's fortunate to have those kind of services close to them you know i'm, I'm not too sure what you guys have around around Ireland, but anywhere else I've lived, not had that. So are you going to ask me happy question now? No more, no more. <laughs> <laughs> Give me what's your opinion on dogs? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Love dogs, love dogs, love, <laughs> love dogs and cats. That's, that's a controversial one. It's usually like, Whoa. I, I, I love dogs and I hate cats, but you know, he's getting ready. Someone say my name. <laughs> you called? Oh, he actually left. He's gone. Yeah, he's had uh, enough. When Dean said the cats thing, he was like, yeah. <laughs> "Get me out of here, bro." It looks like he wants out. Um, yeah, excuse me for a moment. That's all right. Um, you guys can carry on potentially, and uh, Dean will Dean? cut this Dean. out. Hopefully, we'll we'll, uh, we'll switch gears a bit. Um, yeah. Slightly. Ask me a fun question. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll we'll keep we'll keep on topic for the time being, and then we'll uh, we'll, oh, okay. we'll just go into the we'll right. we'll just go into the uh, the hilarious stuff later on. Um, but maybe just a little bit later. Um, just because I think obviously this is a you know the podcast is nutrition and fitness, right? So it's in the fitness industry, diet culture, bodybuilding culture. We're within this sphere of things um and obviously that's that's where i came from a uh, personal training background started bodybuilding training all that kind of stuff um and as you as people will see on instagram there's you know they look at prep coaches they look at gym shark models fitness models you know all of this basically these adonises these great looking people um and all this bodybuilding fitness diet culture that surrounds that but I suppose when we're within the context of binge eating, what do you think? What, well, what's your thoughts on, I suppose, the influences of fitness and bodybuilding culture on someone that might be struggling with this? Or what kind of, what kind of might bring someone along the path to disordered eating patterns because of the stuff, the, the behaviors that they're engaging due to bodybuilding culture? Mm -hmm. diet culture etc um i would say in my mind it would be the probably the fault of well it's probably it boils down to the fault of the people who consume the media to begin with so technically it's our fault that we have these people and we put them on pedestals and that is what is perfect to us and then that becomes more and more perfect the more and more following it gathers the more likes it gets you know whatever else you, you kind of assign status to these people who may not fully deserve it uh, in a way you know so they're almost like superhuman and it's like so then if they receive all that adoration then i need to receive similar levels of adoration to be of worth in the world right so i need the likes i need the follows i need the death so then how do i get there well i need the body but the body is perfect, so I have to be perfect. So it's really this kind of like progressive, 
process of, of falling into a life driven by desperation to become something with no guarantees of happiness is essentially, you know, they're chasing the dragon, if you want to call it that. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, and there's no guarantee at the end of that that, you know, I think you've seen, I mean, how many people have you seen yourself who have, who have achieved these body types and are still the most miserable people? You know, mm. you see them in your local gym all the time. Yeah. So you do. And binge eating is certainly a part of that. And I think if you want to look at where binge eating fits into the context of that, when you get people who are pushing for, or you're becoming more and more desperate, they do more and more extreme things. So I think if you're looking to that, you're probably looking at restriction as a whole, you know, whether it be the fad diet that they're on or the amount of food that they're having or even the amount of exercise that they're doing can be very excessive too. And those can all drive binge eating either through excessive exercise or excessive restriction, deprivation, or even to actually, you know, as we kind of spoke before dealing with difficult emotion, you know, there's no, there's no guarantee that it was the the social media culture, which, caused them to develop this coping skill could have been underlying and it's sort of just been brought to the forefront because they've been now dealing with a lot more difficult emotion you know because they feel like they're so far away from where they need to be so they've got this perfect on a pedestal which they'll never achieve that can drag someone down you know day in day out you know if you put up a post say for example you see one of your favorite YouTubers post a picture of their butt, you know, and it gets like 20,000 likes and you're like, wow, she must be the coolest, best, loveliest, perfectest person in the world. And you post up the same picture and it gets like 10 likes and you're like, I must be the worst person on the face of the earth. Now, realistically, what's the difference? You know, you're just, you're two people who have posted their butt hoping for likes. You know, it's not like a, that shouldn't really be how the worthiness of your life is measured ever you know there's i think the actual i I know we kind of joked about it um i can't even remember if that was before we actually started the the podcast itself you know about how i would do the quizzes and i uploaded 20 of the quizzes and instagram you know shot itself the other day and and deleted them all and i took a rager i was (laughs) like i'm gonna (laughs) i'm gonna go to that boy zuckerberg's house and hit him with a tombstone pie driver uh (laughs) But I think like for that sort of like small window of time, people weren't allowed on social media and they're like, oh my God, there's like, there's life outside of this mm-hmm. sort of nonsense mm-hmm. that goes on. And I get caught up in it too, and like really bad sometimes because I have to spend a lot of time on it. You know, Brian would know, you would know as well, Dean, you know, when it's kind of like, a, it, it's it's part and parcel of your business too. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's especially if you're a remote service that's kind of like your storefront if you want to call it that so it's how you yeah. present what you do to the world and it's also how you engage with people so when you're spending a lot of time you're going to consume things that you shouldn't really be consuming you know i, I shouldn't be looking at these you know photoshopped super you know roided out their mind bodybuilder guys and thinking like well i wonder you know i should probably just go and do a set of curls here you know maybe i'll feel good and it's just like what am i doing but, uh, you know why am i looking at the rock thinking like oh i really wish i looked like the rock you know like me and the rock are two different people i'm more handsome than the rock so i shouldn't <laughs> be wanting to look like him i agree you know? but it's one of those things you get caught up in it so i i think it's it's, it's uh, Maybe like a similar vein to what, I, to what I said about lockdown. You know, if people are walking around with a loaded gun, it pulls the trigger. I feel like you could maybe share a similar sentiment to the role of social media plays. Like, but I would say that, that for some people, it, is, uh, it probably is the cause for why they develop their behaviors. But I think for, for a good load of people too, it's, it's just giving them an excuse to, to go further down the, the rabbit hole of extreme dieting extreme expectations for your body extreme amounts of exercise that sort of thing so 
yeah, I don't like it. If, if that's the easiest answer, I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I think most people go like, I, I would definitely say that that's where I have landed. Um, from being involved in it heavily uh, at the start of my career. Um, I've sort of landed at a place where it's like, uh, I just don't think that it's even the, even the sport of bodybuilding as a whole. And obviously there's going to be like a lot of people that's going to not agree with what I'm about to say, but I, I just don't think that it's overly healthy, especially when you compare it to like a lot of other sports, you know, obviously there's, you know, we could talk um, about binge eating and all the other different sports, but I think, you know, when a component of bodybuilding and being a fitness influencer is you need to restrict your calories um, and have all this food focus and look for all this external val- validation from people online, you know, when, that, when that's like a big component of it, and when you look at other sports, it's that's not really a component of it, or at least it's much less of a component. Um, it just creates this environment, I think, overall, that's, that's not healthy. Um, and yes, you, you can do bodybuilding and it can be, it can be great for you. Like, you know, you can, it can be transformative in a sense as well, but I think overall it can have a massively negative impact because of all the reasons that, that, that we've been talking about, like, you know, a lot of people when they get into bodybuilding forget that you're supposed to build up other parts of your life as well they get so caught up in it you know and it, it, it's it's a sport that attracts people like that mm. you know where you can if you really want to get very extreme with it you can track everything down to like the single kilogram that you're lifting or you know rpe or you know how many sessions did i do this week you know what are my steps you know there's, there's so many metrics to track and people who are seeking that control, which is certainly a theme that factors into to people who, who sort of, you know, when binge eating manifests, control is, is quite an important theme in, in, uh, in a lot of cases. You know, people who are seeking control will go into that, so they will. And I mean, it is, it's, it's it's dangerous you know it, it's really dangerous and it's not just the effect it can have on your on your sort of your mental health but your your physical health as well you know i'm sure you guys i mean i know for a fact you guys have worked with you know women who are dieted down to nothing you know don't even have a menstrual cycle anymore and can't get it back for for months and months and months up to you know you know some years and years and, and uh, you know i've worked with with men even for example who uh like runners and, and, and track and field athletes who have dieted down so much that they've actually they've, they've lost bone mass density and, and they're not going to get that back, you know, and that can shorten a career. So it kind of, you fracture a bone, that's you, you're done. Like there's not really any real sort of coming back to that, you know, mm-hmm. for a lot of people. So, and then like bodybuilding is in the actual sport of bodybuilding. You don't have to look any further to, to sort of like, they've got the Olympia this weekend. You know, they're sort of like me in competition. Sure, one of the competitors died come in the week leading up to it because he was so deprived. He was so like, I don't know, I don't know really what else he was taking, but like, it's not a coincidence that you're seeing more and more of them drop dead, you know, because things are getting so extreme. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, just lift to enjoy it. You know, go to the gym to enjoy it. It's supposed to empower you and better your life. If it's not doing that, then you probably should revise what you're doing. Yeah. Maybe stop looking at butts on Instagram. Yeah. You, Brian. That's where that's where it comes back to just cultivating a feed of puppies and uh, puppies and Jocko, maybe it's good. Hmm. Got a contrast. Wake uh, up. 3 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> You got puppies to look at, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I think, as I said, it's just uh, people put all their eggs into their into that physique basket or that bodybuilding basket, and then they have nothing else to, you know, fall back on. Like they're just kind of underdeveloped as a person. Um, 
it's like, I, I think it was, yeah, I think, I think it was Lane Norton uh, said it before. He's like, you know, if you go through a prep and, and win a, win your little plastic trophy or whatever, um, that's all fine and well. But if you were an arsehole to be around um, and you like, you shut every, every other aspect of your life away for that, then, you know, you've essentially failed. Like you haven't really achieved anything there. Mm. I'd really like a plastic trophy to be fair. <laughs> ask Lane what happens if you're an arsehole to start off with. I'm just asking for a friend. <laughs> um, so they were coming up on around the hour mark. So mm. to lighten the mood, we'll do the uh, the promise this or that, right? So if people are listening to this, you don't know what I, why I'm getting at this. Jamie is... Uh, world famous especially in finland but world famous for his this or that polls on instagram that he puts in his stories um i really i really enjoy them uh, i'll probably start doing them at some point as i said before we started we'll give jamie credit now and then and forever plagiarize um, huh <laughs> yeah i mean well, i'll just change the wording a little bit um <laughs> That are this. These, these are those. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I wanted to put I wanted to put some of those to Jamie because you know he's constantly just making them for other people, but no one ever asks him, hey bro, which which one do you prefer here? Um, I know you give your commentary on them and decide who and who is not a serial killer based on their answers, but uh, you know, we'll we'll do a bit of that. Uh, and then I think you know, you can tell us all about where to find you and learn more about you you probably talked about the recovery community as well um get onto that because uh yeah that's that's relevant so let me take some of these away you ready good okay. let's go uh pizza or burgers burgers coffee or tea coffee what kind of question is that <laughs> <laughs> who in the right mind is gonna pick tea <laughs> Um, will we still or sparkling water? Still, sparkling water, animals. All right. Um, you prefer... why do you drink sparkling? Uh, I drink a uh, combination. I don't I more so drink still water, but you like, I really like sparkling water on a hot day with uh, a coffee. Um, San Pellegrino. I think that's yeah. I think that's a real, a real nice combo. Um yeah um do you no pref- do you prefer uh movies or reading a book uh movies yeah beer or cider neither i don't like drinking okay uh sunshine or snow <laughs> uh sunshine it's controversial considering your influence in in the far north mm. um i don't like icy footpaths because i there's like that opening scene in bambi i've never grown from that scene i'm still that all the time so icy pass like death trap for me if you don't hear from me for three months icy pass jamie <laughs> <laughs> was that guy um do you remember an rte and um, he slipped on the footpath oh, that, that was actually jamie and he, he hasn't got he hasn't got over that yet so icy footpaths are the the devil for him like, yeah. Um, forests or the seaside? Seaside. Okay, it's an easy one, but uh, dogs or cats? Dogs. <laughs> Jamie loves dogs, as do all of us here. Um, Normal people like dogs, I find. Yeah. Serial killers like cats. That seems to be the. <laughs> I mean, it. Uh, it is like. I can somewhat understand if someone has never like had a dog that they may not love dogs, but when someone says that they actively dislike dogs, that is a red flag is a major issue. I must actually start putting them on on the questionnaires that we do uh, and screen people out that um, answer poorly to that. Um, (laughs) Skip them out straight away because that's never going. That's never going to go well. You just need to. No, I, I think subconsciously I would start 
poorly coaching them and, and <laughs> make their situation worse, even if I didn't mean to intentionally. Um, do you prefer breakfast or dinner? Breakfast. Best meal of the day, sir. Oh, okay, okay. Um, podcasts or music? Uh, podcast, of course. Three hours podcast. My favorite podcast, Better Joe Rogan. <laughs> This isn't the triage um, podcast, so that's the only thing. All right, what am I doing on this thing? <laughs> uh, we, we can get you on the triage podcast as well. Yeah. Um, so, that was a good plug then. That was good of me. Uh-huh. I wonder if uh, that was good of me then. That gets me follow-up business. So oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Follow-up airtime. Sure, now you... Would make, really... make sure everyone shares this and tags Joe Rogan <laughs> so I can get on that as well. I feel like that would be a good scale. Yeah, going from uh, Dean's podcast to Joe Rogan. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, you can just you can spend the entire four hours telling them why each of these guests he's had on about nutrition have been wrong and why he's wrong when it comes to nutrition. And after four hours, that you can just you know, excuse yourself and you know say goodbye. Yeah. I think it'd be good. Into. It'll be me, Elon Musk, Alex Jones, and Joe Rogan. We'll just be sitting around a round table, and I'll be teaching them all about. I don't know the benefits of Monster Energy. Yeah, mm-hmm. what you love. Well, there's another one: coffee or Monster Energy monster energy but don't tell anyone what, what's right. your what's your flavor of choice i know we're, we're going off topic here but hmm. i like the original sugar-free black flavor with the blue flavor. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah nah she's done all about that Jeez, i'm I... a connoisseur of this <laughs> <Don't question. laughs> i mix that with one too many a vodka beverage uh in my early 20s and yeah. it's completely ruined it for me now um so that's that's my problem maybe we're the problem dean and, and james just yeah. not i walk around the house like <laughs> you know i treat it like i'm at a wine vineyard every time <laughs> just crack a can open in tesco's and be like mm, vintage <laughs> i had the uh, i had the ultra gold the other day which is pineapple flavor and it was quite enjoyable uh, we don't get that yeah. up here the most uh, exotic one we've got is that mango one, which is a bit too much. I like, I like the, I know, I like the Fiesta a lot. Um, I only got the gold because Body First imported it from the states, so um, it's not actually available anywhere here yet. Um, mm. but yeah, okay. Uh, continue with this or that. Uh, squats or deadlifts? My heart says squats, but my knees say deadlift. <laughs> <laughs> my knees really say deadlift. Yeah. So do. Um, would you rather do 50 calories on the assault bike or 100 burpees? Oh, my God. Uh, assault bike, probably. I don't know if I could do 100 burpees, quite honestly. It's like, see, I'm quite tall. So it's like if I'm trying to do a burpee, it's like disassembling an Ikea kit and building it back again to do one. <laughs> Like my girlfriend's like here, just do like twenty in a circuit. I'm like do one, and I'm like just sitting as a mess on the floor. Like <laughs> one, and it, t- yeah, it takes about a minute to do each yeah. rep. Like uh, I'm burped. I'm burped after one. <laughs> uh, are you protein bars or protein shakes? Bars. Uh, and what's your favorite bar? Mm-hmm. Grenade. Carb killer, dark chocolate, and raspberry. Yeah, okay, yeah, it's a good choice. It's a good mm-hmm. choice. Yeah. And you prefer bench press or pull ups? Uh, pull ups, because I'm good at those. Nice. 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 I agree. <clears throat> and I'm going to make this uh, my last one, unless Dean maybe adds some more in. But uh, when it comes to supplements, you prefer tablets or powders? Tablets. Yeah. Yeah, likewise, brother. All right, that is all I've got for the this or that for Jamie edition. I hope you enjoy that, Jamie. Um, Dean, did you want to add any before we let Jamie give his 
outros, plugs, etc. Um, Gwyneth Paltrow or um, let me see, Gwyneth Paltrow. Actually, no. Here, here's a, here's a good one. Would you rather go on a date with Gwyneth Paltrow or um, eat shards of glass? <laughs> You know, I, I would probably say that if I was to go on a date with her, she'd probably have me eating shards of glass as like a <laughs> wellness. Like, shove this candle where your sun doesn't shine and eat your glass, and <laughs> you'll wake up and your digestion will be improved. Like, sure, it will go. <laughs> yeah, crazy. Good. Yeah. I don't know how she gets away with that stuff she does. Like, like imagine, imagine, like, imagine a dude brought out a dick scented candle and was like wellness like what is that all about (laughs) yeah you should uh, you should try a lot in finland and see see what their reaction is i tried i i've already tried i pushed (laughs) um you should check the news there was the great uh jade stone um law legislation i tried to pass which was every single Finnish person has to have a jade stone up their <laughs> area for one hour a day um to balance their energies and chakras but apparently it didn't fly Finnish people yeah. so you never know we're reintroducing it back again next month it's back on the table next month so i look know. forward to, to seeing the results of that then if uh, if you still are struggling to get your jade stones in the next couple of months, it's because Finland's bought them all. <laughs> you can buy them probably second hand, actually, but I wouldn't. <laughs> uh, I probably wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> and I think on that bombshell, <laughs> we will uh, we will wrap up. Um, so, <laughs> Jamie, if somebody wants to get in contact with you or take a look at all your beautiful content that you post online or potentially look about getting coaching with yourself where where should they go uh, i'd probably question their sanity after listening to this but <laughs> um if you want to find us you can go to balanceie.com uh, that's our site and you can send us a message from there if you want to find out about the coaching there's plenty of information on there and um, if you want to check us out on socials uh, you can go to GME's diet guide, which is all one word, or balance underscore IE, um, which is the business page. Um, and then as Brian kind of said earlier, we also have uh, a free to join Facebook group called Recover8, which is simply just a trying to cultivate a community, a space for people to just open up and talk about their sort of journeys and experiences with uh, rehabilitating their relationship with food. So it's the place where I'll kind of share some of my stuff. It's a place where other people will share their stuff. Um, and yeah, anyone can join. Welcome to anyone. So yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's class, man. Yeah, that's a great, uh, a great space to put in place there for, for people. So uh, well done on that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Brian class class or oh, jamie thank you very much for coming on thank you chatting to us um for the last hour and a bit um but yeah uh we'll wrap it up there uh, unless you've anything to add brain no no just thank you jamie for coming on and shooting the breeze with us um it got dark but there was bright spots as well <laughs> um and yeah always good to catch up uh jamie and i are, are good pals for anyone who may not be aware of that yet so yeah good to catch up we don't see each other uh, nearly often enough but uh, yeah sam for coming on man thanks very much lads thanks for having me all right guys thanks for tuning in we'll catch you guys in the next one